In Titus 2, older women are commanded to teach what is good so they can help younger women love their husbands and children. On today's show, you'll hear from older women who will share timeless, relevant biblical wisdom and personal, profound life experiences to help answer your questions and teach what God says is good so you can be the wife and mother you were created to be. Welcome to another episode of Older Women Likewise. Good evening, sisters, and welcome to Older Women Likewise. Tonight's topic ties in well with our last conversation uh, that we had in our 12 Virtues series about four weeks ago, and that was on courage. So endurance and courage relate to one another in that we must have courage to leap fearlessly toward a desired outcome, right? But patience and endurance, however, patience and endurance is the ability to stick with that thing that we leap fearlessly toward and to keep exerting ourselves for a long period of time in the face of resistance and fatigue. So there's a number of reasons why you may have tuned into the program today. Perhaps you have some challenges around parenting or in your marriage, you are struggling trying to figure out how to endure living perhaps alongside the present darkness in this culture. Perhaps you're watching tonight because you are looking for patience around protecting your sexual purity until marriage or actually enduring maybe some kind of trauma or are even needing help around suicide prevention. So I have spoken at length on all of those specific scenarios where endurance is the key. And those are found on my podcast at nomadsuni.com. And I've even got one dealing with running a marathon. So I think there's close to like 90 podcasts at this point on Nomads You and I. So if you need help in those specific areas, I talk at length there. But the focus of tonight's program will certainly help in all those areas, but in a more general way. Tonight's program will be a more overarching approach to patience and endurance as it relates to the bigger picture of the well-being of your very soul. Because when you take care of of endurance at that level, often many of the other situations are resolved as ripple effects of taking care of what's most important. So let's get started. So endurance is associated, of course, with the acceptance of a given challenge, whether it is something we opted for or if it's something that was dealt to us, like a hand of cards that we just have to play. Endurance is associated, of course, with a sort of surrender to the reality of climbing that mountain that you've been assigned in life um, with resolution. It's the determination, the fortitude, the persistence, the forbearance, the perseverance, and the stamina to make it to the top. So in tonight's program, we will explore this question and several other very practical concepts. First, we will uncover where God says endurance comes from. He's the expert, right? Next, we will look into where endurance plays into God's divine plan for our lives. And we will um, close with how God says he plans to bless those who choose to endure. And on the way, we will learn what role endurance plays in our relationship with God and with one another. So have you ever wondered, are there some people born with endurance while others are not? I mean, some of us have birthed or adopted certain children who seem to have been born with a stronger will than others, right? A stubbornness. That is the very thing that parents knock themselves out trying to channel in a direction that will both serve the strong-willed child and the world at large. I mean, when and if the strong-willed child chooses to take to heart God's wisdom, ask how to use their ta- that tenacity to fight the evil in the world, they will be a force to be reckoned with. So it is a good, good thing. 
Um, you or your child may or may not have been lucky enough to be born with an extra measure of grit. But what I'll be talking about tonight is a source of endurance that is more of a kind of equal opportunity, I'd say. And it's offered to anyone and everyone willing to tap into it. So James, the Lord's brother, encourages us in chapter 5, verses 7 through 11, to be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Now get a load of what lack of patience looks like as I keep on reading here. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, against one another so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. And get this, the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. When we are enduring much longer than we thought we would need to in circumstances we did not see coming, God promises here to bless us with mercy and compassion, just as he did with Job. So take that to heart, warrior princesses. God is there for you to assist you. And so one author addresses the secret of endurance when he says life is a series of problems every time you solve one another is waiting to take its place not all of them are big but all are significant in god's growth process for you we learn things about god in suffering that we can't learn any other way you'll never know that god is all you need until god is all that you have it is during suffering that we learn to pray our most authentic, heartfelt, honest-to-God prayers. When we're in pain, we don't have the energy for any superficial prayers. And God doesn't expect you to be thankful for evil, for sin, for suffering, or for their painful consequences in the world. Instead, God wants you to thank him that, and ask him that he will use your problems to fulfill his purposes. It is vital that you stay focused on God's plan, not your pain or your problem. Your focus will determine your future. The secret of endurance is to remember that your pain is temporary, but your reward will be eternal. Don't give in to short-term thinking. Stay focused on the end result. Servants finish their tasks, fulfill their responsibilities, keep their promises, and complete their commitments. They don't leave a job half done, and they don't quit when they get discouraged. They are trustworthy and dependable. Unquote. So these, these ideas are strung together from Rick Warren's book, um, The Purpose Driven Life. So in Isaiah 40, verse 31, we are introduced to our source of endurance when God promises renewed strength to those who wait on him to provide it. He says, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary, unquote. And, you know, Colossians 111 restates that reality, that endurance and patience comes um, by God's glorious might and adds that endurance is to be accompanied by joy. We see what this looks like in the true story of Paul and Silas's singing in prison, um, even while enduring unjust imprisonment in Acts 16. Or the apostles, after they were flogged and ordered not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, but then they go on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they've been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day they just kept on doing the very thing for which they had been beaten. Um, it says in, in the temple and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, unquote. So, you know, I was thinking about that. I guess they 
cared more about how the listeners of the gospel would spend the first 12 billion years of their existence beyond this life than the last few decades of their own lives. And that is beautiful. That unjust imprisonment that Paul endured was one of many circumstances that he mentions in Philippians 4.13. Um, and those circumstances, he says, taught him how to get along with little. And I also know how to live in prosperity. And in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Isn't it just so encouraging to know that you and I can do difficult things through Christ? Who strengthens us. That's so empowering because you know what? All things are all things, including whatever things that you are enduring right now, sister. So God will be your strength to overcome every obstacle that you will ever face. So how does that work? How does he give us strength to endure? What works to keep us going when we feel utterly and emotionally exhausted, spiritually exhausted, physically exhausted? Our Heavenly Father gives us strength to endure the same way Jesus was strengthened to resist temptation in the desert in Matthew 4, 4. Here it comes. The key to surviving a, a trial is to daily feed on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God for sustenance, spiritual sustenance. How else does God say that we acquire endurance, that endurance that he offers? Hebrews 12, 2 said, Jesus got through the crucifixion by focusing on the joy that was set before him in heaven when he would be reunited with the heavenly father. So Hebrews 12, one through three gives us another tool for making it to the finish line and finishing strong when it says, quote, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us and let's run with endurance the race set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So to plant this concept deep into the hearts of impressionable children in my Bible classes, I'm not embarrassed to say that I would strap to their backs backpack containing tire chains and have them run these little laps around the parking lot at the church building <laughs> and they love it they lo loved it they were like oh this is bible class and while they were afterwards while they were catching their breath we'd review how running life's long race with endurance is made possible only by laying aside the weight of sin and looking to Jesus as an example of enduring hostility without becoming weary or faint-hearted. So, and by the way, I just want to take make a little commercial break right here. Um, this idea of object lessons. You can go on Amazon and look for books on object lessons. And that's the idea of using these physical objects so that your students um, to teach and to use us as examples in parallel so that your students, every time they go through life, they will remember what they learned from you the next time they see, you know, a bag of tire chains or <laughs> whatever you use for your object lesson. And so these are super, super great. Okay, so that's the end of the infomercial. Let's go get back to endurance and patience. So the scripture um, we referenced earlier, that was James 5, 7 through 8, also used a physical object to teach us something about patience when it said, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, like a farmer waiting for fruit. So another application I'd like to add is this. Have you ever noticed that after a farmer does his planting, he doesn't pull up a chair for several weeks and wring his hands about crop failure? He just keeps on planting. 
Maybe he trims some trees over in the orchard while he's waiting. Maybe he oils his machinery. Maybe he goes and weeds in another garden or does some research and so on. So we do well to do the same. Keep moving in the direction that your goal is because our job is to plant. It is God who causes the increase if there is to be an increase. First Corinthians 3, 7. So let's pray for a bountiful harvest of the seeds of truth that we are planting and not let the crop failures in life cause us to be discouraged so that we do not lose our ability to endure. So in Galatians 6, 9, God promises that if we do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season, he says, we will reap if we do not give up. Later in the book of First Corinthians, in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, there's another great visual aid when Paul says, quote, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run a race all, all run the race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. So they do it to ob obtain a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not to run aimlessly, but I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified, unquote. So I'd like to offer you some encouragement here. That if you are feeling like your life feels like a spiritual marathon, the thing is, that feeling may indicate that you may be right on the right track. In some ways, you should be feeling some resistance in life. Have marathoner focus, marathoner consistency, marathoner discipline, and ceaseless concentration, and you will win. Paths clear before those who know where they're going and are determined to get there, someone has noted. So running this spiritual marathon takes a lot of exertion, even when God is sustaining you. Everything of value does, though, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. The other thing is marathoners build muscle. The more they train, the more their hearts and lungs increasingly gain strength to go farther and farther with less and less perceived exertion over time. And they get more fit over time. So that is the very thing that God has in mind for our spiritual training. We must finish strong and not wipe out right before we reach the finish line. Paula Bias has noted, quote, some men give up their designs when they have almost reached the goal, while others, on the contrary, obtain a victory by exerting at the last minute more vigorous efforts than before. I like that because um, there's a spiritual application, isn't there, to exert more vigorous efforts than before the closer you get to that finish line. So Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, quote, we also celebrate in our tribulations. And that really blows a lot of people away. Like celebrate in our tribulations. How could that be? Like, why? What? Let's keep going to find out. So Romans 5, 3 through 5 goes on to say, knowing, here's why we can celebrate, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us, unquote. Ah, see, suffering, as it turns out, is actually useful for the Christian because it produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope of an eternity basking in the glory of our God face to face. So, I mean, that's everything we've ever wanted deep down, whether we realize it or not, is that basking in the glory of our God face to face. Now it makes sense 
that no, and it's no wonder that in James 1, 2 through 4, James says, quote, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials and various of uh, various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect. So you guys, here comes the goal on this verse. It says that you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. So the word perfect here is about maturity, like a fresh peach that has been ripened to complete perfection. So sometimes the things we are enduring may be physical in nature, a disease or an injury that is painful or life-threatening. Sometimes it can be like the loss of a loved one. It can be a financial setback or worse, a child or someone else that we love who is rejecting God's wisdom for their lives to their own hurt. First Peter 2.20 mentions another situation that demands our endurance when it says, quote, if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you for it, you patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. I mean, we will have more endurance if we look at Every injustice as an opportunity to find God's favor. Now let's keep reading. Verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose. Pause. I mean, wow. The suffering that we endure is not a fluke, sisters. It's actually a part of our purpose. Um, when we choose to follow Christ, it's part of that purpose. And let's go on to read here. It says, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you will follow in his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And get this part, um, because this part teaches what endurance looks like and sounds like. Okay. It goes, while being abusively insulted, he did not insult in return. While suffering, he did not threaten, but, okay, so what did he do instead? It says, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Sisters, take that to heart. Plant it deep, deep, deep in your spirit. And that is this, when you do good and suffer for it, such is no, nothing less than an opportunity to obtain grace in the sight of God and ultimately leads to an eternity of inexpressible joy far beyond comparison. Second Corinthians 4, 17, where sin does not exist, peace and joy are constant and the glory of God illumines it. Revelation 21. So, I mean, after the last election, a lot of students of history experienced a heightened sense of what may lie in the not too distant future for Christians. I mean, yes, anything can happen, anything. But since it is God who makes nations rise and fall, it really is none of our business to try to predict the future or wring our hands over what his perfect plan might be. If he judges this nation for iniquity that is so prevalent that we export out now to the whole world, praise him. For the judgments of the Lord are pure and righteous altogether. Psalms 19.9. All that we know for certain is that we are told to be anxious for nothing in Philippians 4.6. And that Jesus tells his followers in Matthew 5.10 that if the trial we need to re endure is a result of our Christianity, we are promised the kingdom of heaven. And just like during the fall of Jerusalem that's described in Matthew 24, Jesus said it is the one who endures to the end that God promises to save. So let's knit together in our hearts the connection of enduring suffering with hope because Romans 12, 12 and verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 4, in those verses, we learn that God wants us to be patient in tribulation because it, is, it is through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures that we have hope. James 1, 12 describes one beautiful aspect of that hope. When it adds, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For once he has stood the test, he receives the crown of life, 
which God has promised to those that love him. The crown of life. I am in eager anticipation of that crown of life. Um, Not so much for the crown itself, but for the favor of God that it represents. I know that many of our listeners tonight feel the same way. Maybe we will all cast our crowns before his throne like the elders do in Revelation 4.10. I don't know, but let's find out together. The last scripture that I would like to close with tonight is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, where God says through Paul, quote, We also believe, therefore, we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sakes. Um, Let me pause there just to note that what a lesson for Christians that nothing happens to us, but rather everything happens for us. All things work together for us. And the verse that says all things work together for the good of those who love God. So he also goes on to say this quote, so that grace having spread to more and more people will cause Thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. So let me just start right, stop right here and add, which that's what life's about, you guys, right? The glory of God. And so that's the goal of all things. So let's listen to how this verse ends. It goes on to say, therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outward person is decaying, yet our inward person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things that are seen are temporal but the things that are not that are seen the things that are not seen excuse me are eternal that's why the faithful will never lose heart why because no matter what's going on around us Our inner self, that part that will exist eternally, is being renewed day by day. If we view our trials as light momentary affliction that is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, endurance all of a sudden becomes more doable. So I'll close again with this beautiful quote from C.S. Lewis, who says, quote, no amount of falls will really undo us if we keep on picking ourselves up each time. We shall, of course, be very muddy and tattered children by the time we reach home, but the bathrooms are ready, the towels are put out, and the clean clothes in the airing cupboard. The only fatal thing is to lose one's temper and give up, unquote, C.S. Lewis. So you have got this at your fingertips, everything that you need for life and godliness to conquer everything that is put before you that you must endure. So I am rooting for you. The angels in heaven are rooting for you and God himself is ready to empower you. May you begin to taste the victory that overcomes the world. Good night and God bless sisters. We'll see you next time.